Uh, I'm, you know, I'm nowhere near where I want it to be, but that's perfectly fine. So, uh, so this is uh, the cube rates, which are motivating all these issues. Uh, so this is the half fill system. Uh, so the density of holes in this thing is zero in the usual cube rate way of talking about things. Uh, and I put in, however, this is the fill band, okay? So there are two reference states. There's the antiferromagnet, there's the fill band. Now if I put in, in the antiferromagnet, uh, these holes here, the density of this is, I'm gonna call that P, what I've been calling P. Oh, yeah, this is precisely to answer your question. <laughs> uh, so this density of holes relative to the antiferromagnet is P, but relative to, the, to this state, which is the fill band, if I take this state, the density of holes is one plus P, okay? So if I use Fermi liquid theory, I have to start with a reference point which is non-interacting. And the non-interacting insulating state is not this, it's this. This is the insulating state. So Fermi liquid theory would say that when I put in P holes here and I get a state that's a metal which doesn't break any symmetry, then the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface of holes should be one plus P. That's the statement of Fermi liquid theory. Uh, whereas the state I described had density, had volume of Fermi surface P, not one plus P. So that's why it had all this exotic structure associated with it. That, that was the main message of everything I wanted to say last time, uh, in the last hour. Okay, uh, so I'm going to skip ahead. So we, we certainly have reviewed Fermi. So you can, uh, these slides are on the website. Oops, what happened there? Yeah. And uh, so you can uh, find them over there. And I think uh, oh, I have to do the equal to so, but now I'm going to move ahead to uh, where I want to be. So I reviewed Fermi liquid theory, and then I introduced the fractionized Fermi liquid. Uh, so here's a, here's a picture of the fractionized Fermi liquid. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so this is the there's a state where the hole has formed uh, a bound state. It's sitting there and there. And then that whole combination is my green dimer. It was originally orange on the uh, uh, on the board, and now these uh, now these green guys can move around in this complicated dance with the with the blue dimers. And as they move around, they just behave almost like free fermions uh, of spin a half and charge e. So so what they want to do is form a Fermi surface. So this is this is what I went through uh, things that I showed you. So if I draw a cut then the parity of the number of bonds across the cut is preserved by every one of those moves. And the only way you can change the parity is if you take this uh, blue guy, split it into two spin a halves, move the spin a halves all the way around the sample, and then this one and that one across the sample form a gigantic, oops, uh, form a exponentially unlikely bond. And now I have an odd, a different parity by doing that process. Okay. Uh, okay, that's uh, I've already mentioned. So what we did recently was actually took a model uh, where you have some matrix elements for all these processes that I was pictorially illustrating. Uh, and in this model, and you can work out the parameters relative to some model appropriate for the cube rates. Uh, and this is the dispersion of the green fermions. And so they, what they want to do is sit over here. Uh, and this is their quasi-particle residue that comes from the fact that they're moving the sea of blue dimers. And they're moving in this entangled background and gives you a fairly non-trivial K-dependence quasi-particle residue. Uh, and, and so then you get up these Fermi surfaces with the total area enclosed by these surfaces uh, is, uh, uh, <coughs> is P and, and the spectral weight. So this is something I haven't discussed, but what comes out of this calculation, the spectral weight on one side is much smaller than the spectral weight on this side. But it's non-zero everywhere. It's really an actual Fermi pocket. Uh, Okay, so now let me just review, so talk about experiments. So this is, uh, of course, a picture drawn right here at Cornell uh, of the phase diagram of the cube rates. Uh, though there's a whole alphabet soup of phases, uh, which some of us really love, but others perhaps rather not hear about them. But let me just quickly go through them. Uh, so there's the antiferromagnet, where this, uh, which we know, and the high temperature superconductor that we know and love, but let's ignore those two very important phases and talk about uh, this region here above TC. So what we know out here at high doping uh, from photo emission, you do exactly see uh, area enclosed of one plus P and you see various Fermi liquid behaviors. 
So, uh, so that's great. So there, uh, you do have band theory seem to work uh, very well, and quantum oscillations and many other things. Uh, so the, a lot of the debate has to do with this PG region, uh, and this is the kind of thing uh, you see in photoemission, and there's been, of course, a huge amount of work that uh, I will briefly mention uh, on broken symmetries and density wave orders. That's what DW stands for in this shaded region. Uh, but what's become clear now in the last uh, three years uh, is that you know, all of the density wave order is ubiquitous in all of the cuprates. Uh, once you get above about 150 Kelvin, there's really no sign of it. Uh, but in this region, which I call PG, or the high temperature PG, you have some sort of metal, uh, which is still not a conventional metal, where there's no obvious broken symmetry, uh, and photoemission you know, show these arc-like features. So that's been a long-standing mystery of what this pseudo-gap is. And it seemed like, you know, the world's most complicated phase that everyone has worked on some time but then gets tired of it because it's so confusing. Uh, so what's been, however, rather remarkable in the last few years is that there's, what's becoming clear, there's actually some very beautiful simplicity to the pseudo-gap. People always thought it was something really complicated. Uh, so one idea of the simplicity already goes back to this measurement a few years ago uh, of the Hall coefficient in the pseudo-gap regime. Uh, and what you find at, even at high temperatures is a temperature-independent Hall coefficient of, plus, of density plus P. So if I just close my eyes and I just told you, here's a metal uh, which has density P of holes. And you would look at this and say, yeah, of course, this is a metal of density P of holes, all coefficient temperature independent. We, that's the low temperature state of a good semiconductor with density P. Uh, and that's what it looks like. But of course, we, we've, at least from photo emission, we've been seeing that it's really rather a mess. Uh, but this looks very simple. Um, this looks like a Fermi liquid of density P. Uh, and what's happened since then is, especially in, starting with this paper of uh, Dirk van Dalmero, so what, uh, I, what he measured in many different high temperature superconductors in this pseudo-gap phase uh, is the frequency and temperature dependence of the conductivity at you know, infrared, far infrared frequencies uh, over a whole range of temperatures in this pseudo-gap regime. As you can see, there are relatively high temperatures here. Uh, and what you see is very beautifully and high, very accurately that this time, the scattering time of, the, of the, whatever the charge carriers are, has exactly the Fermi liquid behavior. So omega squared plus T squared. So you know, that would be a consequence of property A that I talked about, that you have quasi-particles that are weakly interacting and have lifetime going as energy squared. And that's exactly what you see here uh, in very great detail in many of the cube rates. Uh, more recently, there's this work of Martin Greven, who has looked at Magneto resistance. So here's uh, how the resistance depends on magnetic field and temperature. So first of all, he finds that rho xx is 1 over tau. Uh, tau goes as t squared. So rho goes as t squared. So tau goes as 1 over t squared. That's again what I showed said earlier. 1 over tau goes as t squared or omega squared. Uh, so that's exactly what you see. But furthermore, if you take this theory of quasiparticles, which are just in a magnetic field are moving around in some cyclotron orbits, around the Fermi surface, uh, so then you open up Zyman, book written in the 1960s, and what happens to the magneto resistance from the orbital effect of quasi-particles moving around the Fermi surface, uh, what Zyman uh, predicted in some, well, I guess it's called Kohler's rule, which is that the, the resistance uh, should go as field squared, and furthermore, the coefficient of the field squared term should go as tau squared, meaning it should go as one over t to the fourth. So that's a very specific consequence, which I only know how to get in this kind of Fermi liquid picture of quasi-particles. Uh, and that's indeed what uh, Greven sees in the pseudo-gap regime, that this tau goes as one way. This tau appears as t squared both here and there in exactly the right way. So that's, again, a very beautiful simplicity. So everything is really cool. Everything seems to be working with one, one problem, well, two problems, really. The density of carriers is not 1 plus p, which is what Fermi liquid theory would say. And second problem, the photo emission looks like a mess. Uh, but transport looks very beautiful uh, and conventional. What, what do you mean by 
Well, this Fermi arc, that's, that's, that's what I mean by a mess. <laughs> okay, so of course, uh, imagine I haven't given the, the lecture you just heard. So if you look at this data and didn't know anything else, you say, how can you have a, you would, this is the question you would ask. Can you find a metal of quasi-particles which are perfectly conventional uh, on a Fermi surface of size p, not 1 plus p? And of course the answer is yes. I just spent the last hour explaining how you can get such a state. Uh, and so our proposal is that this state here and what's being seen in the photo emission uh, is really like a remnant of this state. Uh, so the, there is in fact something on the other side. Uh, it's just that the, at these high temperatures it gets, you know. So these are in some sense what we are saying at this state here, which we think of as high temperature, relative to J, this is actually low temperature. It's really like the ground, it's almost like a ground state of some metal. We could, and the reason we think that must be the case is because of these very beautiful transport properties. These are very low temperature properties of a Fermi liquid. Uh, and so this high temperature pseudo gap looks like a low temperature metal, really. Now, if you had some more exotic model, which we've worked on a lot on ourselves, <coughs> fluctuating this and fluctuating that, you know, the correlation length of whatever fluctuating here must be some strong function of temperature, and you would then get some highly non-trivial temperature dependence ref reflecting your fluctuating therm thermal fluctuations of your order. You won't see any of that. What you see is actually like a quantum behavior, low temperature quantum behavior of this exotic metal. Okay. <laughs> what? Sorry? Yeah, this is momentum, kx and ky, right. What do you mean by this? Shape. These dashed lines? No, no, the, the, this? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are the pockets I drew earlier. So those are, you know, those, if you wish, are, you take these green dimers, that's the crude picture, they form little Fermi pockets. Uh, so this calculation showed this is the kind of thing they form, or, or these. But the, what I didn't talk about was the residue. There's a quasi particle residue, which has to do with the wave function of the quasi particle. And that turns out to have a highly ionizotropic form. So, I mean, so this kind of picture ha has an appealing simplicity, I believe. Uh, really, to settle this to everyone's conviction, we have to see the other side some more directly. Rather, I mean, the magneto resistance, you could say, is somehow seeing the whole pocket, because that's the only way we can understand that behavior. Uh, the reason, you know, photoemission is a bit of a complicated probe because it's actually removing an electron from the sample. When you remove the electron from the sample, uh, you really are very sensitive to exactly how the electron is arranged in terms of all these dimers. But if you're doing transport, you're not removing anything. These green dimers look just like ordinary quasi-particles. They're all happy to live in the plane. Yeah? So is it easy to explain why you get the phase transitions to the anti-paramagnetic electrical conductivity when you change the um, yeah, so that's the kind of model that, in fact, Yang Chi was working on. So I gave you this dimer picture, but there are many other approaches uh, which can address those issues. But okay, yeah. How the quasi particles nervous at this temperature span and growth? Well, uh, you know, I think the uh, I think on this side it's relatively. I mean, I don't know. Uh, they're relatively sharp. I mean, you see them right there. I, mean, I don't think that's been studied very well. Yeah. I don't know. These are, they are broad, when people talk about broad quasi, they're invariably referring to the nodal region in this region. Along the, ant, the, so in the anti-nodal direction. Along this direction, they're relatively sharp, I think. Yeah. It's kind of surprising that the, yeah. the transport is so permaliquid. It is, it, it is quite amazing. So I think, those, I know, those experiments are really quite remarkable, and they're very consistent. There are several experiments now, uh, and so that's, Absolutely. This transport is really quite amazing. Even though it looks boring, it's really amazing. Yes. What's the bandwidth? What's the kind of estimated bandwidth of that pocket? Uh, bandwidth? Well, it'll be about a J, but yeah, uh, that's the typical scale. We can't do anything better than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that, uh, right, we start with the TJ model. Uh, and we do all kinds of gross approximations. So we start with the, the T, 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 this is the usual T, T model, and we just project onto this subspace and compute what these matrix elements are, and that's, that's the relationship, that's all. Yeah. So that's the model we took, and it immediately gives us this, these results. 
which are you know, very good, in, at least for the simplicity of the calculation, will look very, at least in the right direction for the experiments. Yeah. So the model only has your, your, your orange dimers? It has only one orange dimer. At least the cal this is done with just one orange dimer moving in a sea of, of blue dimers. Right. And right. the C's model do have you taken the parameters from the matrix? Yeah, so it's a quantum dimer model with one fermion and the rest of bosons. Uh, that's all, right? <laughs> it's the kind of model that could have been written down in 1991. It's just nobody did. <laughs> it's very simple. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right, right. So that's absolutely. So all these statements of Fermi liquid theorem and all of that, they're all only zero temperature statements. Uh, but for all, all the world, it looks like the pseudo gap regime is behaving like an almost zero temperature state. Certainly in the T squared dependence of all the transport properties, omega squared and H squared, all of that uh, is very conventional. So relative to the energy scale of J, which is 1,000 Kelvin, maybe 250 Kelvin is pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> what about the temperature dependence of the length of the arc? Yeah. Right, so uh, that may well have to do with pairing or density wave fluctuations. And yeah, I don't know how to. You need something else. To yeah, when you're going down to lower temperatures, yeah. but. You know, what, ideally what, what I'd want is to take a really pure sample uh, and then go to these high temperatures here uh, and then measure quantum oscillation. Of course, when I mention that to my experimentalist friend, they say that's impossible, but uh, let's see. <laughs> so you, you, want, you want some material which is clean enough where you're able to push TC down by some trick and then you're able to work up there so that a magnetic field doesn't induce any density wave order. So of course we have beautiful quantum oscillations at low temperatures, but those are clearly infected by the density wave. The uh, question is what's happening up there? And I would say that all the ex indication of the experiments are, it's actually something very simple. It just looks like uh, so this. So your, <laughs> your model is the transport and our Let's yeah. Support. Right, right. I mean, I, I really don't know what else it could be. I mean, if you have another proposal, which, uh, you know, if you, if you take fluctuating orders, as I said, and that really has problems with these T squared. I don't know how you get, first of all, you have to start with a large Fermi surface, and then you've got to reconstruct the large Fermi surface. And that whole reconstruction depends upon the strength of your order, uh, uh, fluctuating superconducting or density wave order. Yeah, and then I don't see any reason why all these transport properties should depend on T squared. Um, yeah. So we'll see. But anyway, that's uh, you know, that's the current situation. Yeah. Okay. Why do you want to avoid the density wave? Because it's changing the Fermi surface. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, in a high field, it certainly becomes. When you do quantum oscillation, it seems to become long range, right? Yeah. yeah. That's where the quantum oscillation. So you want to be able to see. Somehow the magic trick is I'm hoping someday there's an experiment which is at high enough fields and low enough temperatures without density wave order and sees quantum oscillations. That would then really solve this problem. <laughs> okay, how much time do I have, Tom? <laughs> All right. 35 minutes. Okay. All right, um, well, okay, there's a whole long saga about this density wave order. Um, I don't know, probably here at Cornell, you've heard a lot about this. He said experiments at Cornell and how we understand them. Uh, let me just quickly say, you know, we think it's some kind of deform factor density wave here. There's a lot of evidence for that now. Uh, and there's also a connection between this proposal for what's happening up here. In fact, that was how I started working on this thing. Uh, due to ideas by, uh, so the Fermi, if you start from a Fermi liquid and try to get this density wave, you run into trouble. But if you start from this fractionized Fermi liquid, then as Debanjan uh, uh, convinced me, uh, that gives you a route very nicely to getting precisely uh, what's happening at low temperature. So this is a, another piece of evidence that will take a whole other talk to describe. 
that what's happening at low temperatures in terms of the density wave also seem consistent with something more exotic uh, at high temperatures. Uh, and more conventional approaches have great difficulty getting a state of this site uh, as the optimal state. Um, and that's in fact how this all started. So uh, that's how, that was the first thing we did and then everything else was <laughs> backwards. <laughs> Does your, uh, yeah. does your uh, FL star state have a uh, high susceptibility to pairing, or does it have to be? Uh, not particularly. Yeah, yeah not. Uh, I think at least this dimer model has been cooked up just to avoid pairing. Uh, <laughs> it's a metal. Well, you want. I was thinking of Anderson's basic idea, <coughs> let, the, let the pair free. Well, so you, you then want to have. Uh, Actually, hold ons bind. You want to have pairs of, you want to have a new type of dimer which has two holes. Yeah, right. So we just threw them out because we don't want superconductivity. We just want a metal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uniform magnetic susceptibility, doesn't that kind of keep dropping across the temperature? Yeah, right, right. So that's the pseudo gap. I mean, that's presumably related to the fact that these singlets are forming, right? That's, that's what's giving you the singlets that allows you to form. Uh, it's giving you the blue dimers so that the orange dimers can form or the green. Very strange that one would be able to observe, you know, scaling, uh, thermal good scaling in a regime where you know, things are still. I know, I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. So that's that's exactly the point. Yeah, the, the, these transport measurements are really quite amazing, and they seem to have been confirmed across many samples and many different observations. So. Would there be some other pirate? Of this uh, FL star, other than seeing the pocket, uh, some possibly distant future experiment. Well, I mean, we could, you know, we've been talking of obviously. Is there, I don't know, direct manifestation of a plot so That's what Seamus keeps asking us, and I guess you, maybe you. you uh, well, well, I think somehow you want to see this backside. And it's very hard to see in photoemission because photoemission involves removing an electron from the sample. So if you can do an experiment where you don't remove an electron from the sample, then there's really the intensity of the front and the back side are the same. It's only because you have this overlap from a bare electron to the renormalized fermion in there. So you could imagine, you know, and you could imagine, say, putting in a zinc impurity and looking for Friedel oscillation at this wave vector or something, so, something in the sample, or putting in a magnetic field and seeing quasi-particles go around. But uh, we've been, so we've been thinking about various things. Uh, I mean, I ultimately, you know, surface acoustic. So well, there's sort of an analogy. For example, the new equals one half quantum Hall state, which is also a metal. We think of it as quasi-particle. But if you did tunneling for the new equals one half state, you don't ever see the Fermi surface. People were eventually able to see it by the surface acoustic wave, um, and that all involved some resonance of the quasi particle in the sample. The trouble is, surface acoustic here, the density is so much smaller, or so much higher, the landscape is so much smaller that that's not a feasible experiment as far as I know. But maybe there's something possible. Could you take a very small device and write a flux quantum through it and uh, yeah. something, something, something? That's what that was Santos proposed a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't quite worked. But they won't, you know, I think they need to be look. In, in fact, what probably happens is, uh, uh, you know, that as you go down here, there's some kind of confinement crossover. So you probably don't expect it to work down here because this state down here is probably confining. You really should do it up there. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it seems like you said that in tunneling there will be no difference between the front side and the back side of the arc. Oh, no, in tunneling there is. In tunneling there is. Because that involves removing an electron from the sample. Okay. But so if that's you. So you don't see QPR. Uh, yes, correct, correct. But if you look for density modulations, which is not quite by, by Friedel, where you just had a probe measuring the local density, and the dens that, there you're tunneling, but you're not really tunneling into those electrons. In some sense, you're just measuring the local density. It's, you could possibly see in QPI, but it, you know. It, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, right, if you, if you use, well, I would say, if you do energy integrated tunneling, where just using that as a measure of the local electron density, 
then, uh, then the, the fact that you're tunneling is not that important because you're tunneling at other energies. When you measure the local density, uh, then the Friedel oscillations or things like that uh, will, be, will be just equally sensitive to the front and the back. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, there may well be ways. I think it's well worth thinking, but I think, yeah, you know. The toy right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So does this scenario of the pseudo gap shed some interesting light on the comparing mechanism of supernatural? Because I see you're placing the supernatural somewhat on top of the putative uh, on the critical point of the pseudo gap. Uh, sorry, here? You're talking about that critical point? Uh, I'm not saying anything about that right now, but the superconducting pairing fluctuations and so on, again, they're, they're again around this temperature range. They don't seem to be really way up there, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's known that in the supercapture region, the high temperature parts, yeah. how the, the, say the circuit energy depends on temperature and frequency. It's known from the That was exactly Max's question. Uh, you know, I, I, I would know that maybe there's a photodimension expert who can enlighten me, but uh, as far as my, my understanding is that if you look along the nodal direction, it always looks pretty sharp, but only in the anti-nodal direction it becomes very broad. So I'm talking about the nodal direction. Yeah. So there's yeah. also anisotropy in the momentum space. Uh, correct, correct. But here, so this model of FL star has very strong anisotropy in momentum space, you know, because there's no quasi-particle there at all. <laughs> yeah. There are probably other, there are maybe other ways of getting that anisotropy. If you yeah, allow, yeah. I mean, forming as a booster with a uh, factor, if you allow for inhomogeneity, you get uh, a very strong anisotropy. You get cold spots at the moment. Right, but but the trouble with all those explanations, I think, is it maybe they work here, but how do they work up here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if this DW went all the way up there, uh, yeah, that. But then, if it really did. In that model, I had a really hard time imagining why you'd get T squared resistivity and so on, because the DW would be strongly temperature dependent. Uh, yeah, so, and frequency. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, I must, you know, many of us, have, including us, worked a lot of those models. And uh, I think if you look at everything together, to me, this is the most plausible scenario. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe this is a bit difficult to, to address, but do you have a picture how this uh, picture that of quasi particle eventually dissolves as you raise temperature of order of J or of order of say, T star? Uh, uh -huh. How does that destroy? It's destroyed. Right, so we certainly have many pictures. And they all have to do with this quantum critical point and its quantum crossover from the strange metal to that. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have many models, and I'll describe one of them. But, but I'll, no, I'll describe a toy model right now, uh, but I certainly won't go anywhere near describing this. I'll just describe some model of a strange model. But I think that would be the last thing that will be solved in this game. <laughs> I would say the next thing that I think we're getting quite close to solving is what is this. And then perhaps we're understanding what's going on here. I think there's a lot of experiments, and maybe in the next decade or before I die, we'll understand something about this. <laughs> uh, and then to understand this, okay. In my lifetime, if I see that, I will be happy. <laughs> yeah. Does it make sense to ask a question, okay, so you're solving one phase. You write down this state, yeah. and then you write down the superconducting state. Yeah. And you write down strange methods. Yeah. Like you know, as you change the parameters, connect with those. Right. So if it's, if these are all broken symmetries, you know, that's the usual logic. You figure out all these states and their broken symmetries, and use Landau theory and get the quantum critical points, and everything is solved. If it that formula, I think, is pretty clear, is not working. Uh, and, uh, you know, here, for example, f f uh, STM shows a dramatic change from the arc to the, to the full Fermi surface. And this is a regime where clearly the density wave order doesn't have enough coherence to explain that. So it looks like there is density wave order, but that's making life more difficult in some ways because it's hiding the real critical point, which is probably some kind of confinement transition 
from FL star to FL, for example. So that's something we're working on, trying to think of various critical points. I guess, like, to put the question like simply and concise, is like, when are coup rates going to be solved? Like, what is the easy, like, no, no, no. kind of information? OK, so this is just for this audience. You know, when you're talking to a particle theorist, the correct answer to this question is the coup rates are solved. Because we know, we know the Hamiltonian. We know it's been it's a Hubbard and Mike model. And, and we know the basic degrees of freedom. Uh, we just can't compute TC in a few details. <laughs> it's sort of the same situation with QCD, right? QCD, we know there's quarks, but nobody can really compute this mass and that crossing cross section. Uh, I'm just joking, but. <laughs> Yes. That's true. Well, I would say so. For if you make the analogy of QCD, I mean, there people are doing very well uh, in terms of starting from QCD and quarks and computing real things in experiments. And the reason they can do that is because they don't have the sign problem. Here, it's as hard. There's a similar confinement crossover, but you also have the sign problem. So it's very difficult. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's fun. Uh, so, okay, I, I don't have very much time. So, so then, as I mentioned, there is, of course, uh, the biggest mystery of them all, which is the strange metal. So, where uh, you know everything seems to be broad, you don't get any of these t squared dependencies. You get linear in temperature resistivity, very strange Hall coefficients, photo emission looking very strange. Uh, and really, uh, there's many proposals, none of which we don't really have an idea of which is going to ultimately work. Uh, I, I think here we're getting much closer. But once this is nailed down, and perhaps eventually we'll understand something about the strange metal and its possible relation to a critical point here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, and there's no shortage of work of candidates for strange metals. Uh, there's one category which a fair amount of progress has been made is you start from a Fermi liquid, and then you have some broken symmetry. For example, this pneumatic order parameter is a very attractive candidate where you break 90 degree rotation symmetry. And right at the critical point, you do get an example of looks like a strange metal. I was planning to say a bit more about that, but I have to end by 12.30, is that right? Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah, that's 12.35. OK, fine. So I won't have time, but what I'm going to do uh, in the next uh, few minutes uh, is give you actually a, a solvable model, a simple solvable model which goes back to my work with Jin Wu Ye in 93 uh, of a strange metal. And it's a kind of a cute model. It's got a lot of artifacts, but at least it's solvable. Uh, and even that is uh, in many ways a big mystery. OK, so I'm going to raise this up. Uh, where is the uh, screen? Uh, oh, there, I see it. I'm okay. And then I'm going to put a B here. Okay. And then I'm going to turn the lights on. Oh, cool. I got it. Yeah. So, so what we've seen from this phase diagram uh, of the experiments, that there's lots of strange uh, metals float. I mean, there's pseudo gap metal, there's a strange metal, lots of very bizarre behavior floating around. But one obstacle to really understanding this behavior is that when you take these materials and take them even lower temperature, something else happens. You get annoying things like superconductivity uh, and so on, <laughs> and density wave orders. Uh, and that makes it much more difficult in experiment to figure out what this really novel states are. So you want models anyway, but in those models, these things don't happen. Uh, and then understand the model as best as we can. Uh, and it's in that spirit I'm going to talk about uh, these models. So I'll begin by talking about actually a model of a Fermi liquid. Uh, and it's a very simple model. It initially doesn't even have interactions. So I take H. It doesn't even have momentum. So I just take, I won't even have spin. OK. <laughs> so it's just Tij, C dagger I, Cj, plus some plus some four-body terms, C dagger, C dagger, C, C. And I won't even say what they are. Uh, and I and J go from 1 to N. Uh, and uh, the main thing I'm going to take now is, and I'm going to put a 1 over square root of N here. 
and I take Tij uh, independent and Gaussian variables, and in fact, complex variables. Just totally random, okay? So it's what's called a random matrix model. Just a comp random, if I forget about the interaction, it's just a matrix where every matrix element is a random number, okay? So basically that means that uh, average of Tij, when I average over all sites, uh, is zero, and average of Tij star T K L uh, is equal to, well, some T squared times delta I L delta J K, or something like that. So they have to be the same bond, uh, uh, otherwise uh, they aren't correlated. Okay. So this is a model that's solvable. It's, and I'm, let me just show you how you solve it. If I, if I just close my eyes and did perturbation theory, I can figure out what the Green's function of this thing is. And I just do perturbation theory. Uh, and there's, of course, a, uh, I'm going to put a chemical potential, which I haven't written out. So my G0, uh, this will be G0. Uh, uh, now let me work in uh, Matsubara frequency if you want. So it's from I omega plus mu. Then my first, if I did perturbation theory, my first correction would be something like this. Uh, uh, this thing, uh, you know, I have an electron I. I pick up a factor of Tij here, and then I get an electron J. So this is G0 of, uh, this is delta Ij. It's completely on site. So if, if the Hamiltonian is zero, then it's just an on site Green's function. So this is the first correction. Now I take the average of this, so that gives me zero. So this, is, this doesn't contribute. Then I take the second term. So the second term would be something like this. I get a t here and a t here. This will be i, j, k. Uh, and I'm going to average this. Uh, and when I average this and use this rule, uh, so I average this, I'll get this is equal to t squared times delta i, k. And then down here, I'm going to get G of JJ, or G0 of JJ. OK. Um, OK. Then the cool thing now, oh, there's a 1 over n here. Uh, that's come from this 1 over square root of n. Uh, but then I sum over J. So what I, what I anticipate in the end, that every site is the same as every other site. So the Green's function, in fact, will be just local. The full Green's function is just local when I average. And then everyone is every other site. In fact, it's self-averaging. If we just took one realization of this and measured the Green's function, it would be the same on every site. Um, so since it's independent of j, this just becomes t squared times g0. OK, so then I go to next order. Uh, and at next order, well, at third order, we see it's just zero because the odd number of t's just give me zero. But at fourth order, uh, I'll get, you know, I get uh, four t's, and I won't write the labels. And when I average over the t's, I'll, I'll write the averaging by drawing these dashed lines. And I'll draw a dashed line between two sides, which eventually become equal. So when I put a dashed line here, this becomes equal to that. Right? So there's many ways of drawing dashed lines. So you can draw this thing. Uh, you can draw. Uh, you can draw something like this. And then you can draw something like this. Uh, okay. So now you draw these dashed lines, you sum over all the sites. Uh, I won't go through the very trivial algebra. Uh, what you'll find at this thing, when you sum over sites, this is of order t to the fourth, uh, your t fourth, which is a real number. This is also t fourth. But this one uh, is of t fourth, but it'll have a factor of 1 over n. And that's because if you now look at how this is connecting the sites, you know, this site is equal to that site. But then, because of this, this is equal to that one. 
And so the number of free sites is smaller. You just work it through. It's a very standard thing. So this graph uh, goes to zero uh, as n goes to infinity. OK, so it's a very standard kind of thing. And uh, you just take this Gaussian matrix model. So when you're all said and done, the only graph that survives are the ones that have uh, basically are kind of uh, these rainbow graphs. I mean, everything just ev where the lines don't intersect. The non-crossing graphs are the only ones that survive. OK, so you can do this to all orders. And so now you can see that uh, as n goes to infinity, there's a very simple equation for Uh, there's a very simple equation, so your g it becomes independent of site. G of is equal to uh, i omega minus mu minus sub sigma of omega, and sigma of omega you can just see from you know is this graph is this this just becomes the full Green's function, uh, and I believe it's a plus if I remember right. If I didn't, doesn't matter. Is t squared g of omega. As n goes to infinity, that's the basic Green's function. Okay, <laughs> because the self-energy is just the Green's function, and that's it. All right. So now that's the world's simplest problem to solve. It's just a quadratic equation for g, uh, and I will just tell you what the answer is. So if you solve this, you find m g turns out to be square root of uh, four t squared minus omega squared. Uh, there's a mu here, which I forgot. So there will be, uh, this is for now real frequencies. Uh, this is the retarded Green's function in the omega minus mu squared. Uh, uh, is that correct? No, no, yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so the, what this is, is what's called, called the famous semicircular density of states. So if I look at the density of states of this model, uh, Um, it looks something like this. Here's omega, uh, or oh, well, this is energy, and it goes from minus 2t to plus 2t. This is the density of state, rho of energy, uh, and it's a semicircular thing. Uh, and you've got some chemical potential here. These are the filled states, these are the empty states. There's a Fermi energy, uh, and uh, right, and, and, and right at the Fermi energy, the imaginary part of the Green's function is finite. Okay, so there's a local density of states that's some non-zero value. All right, so that's a very quick solution of a, a very trivial model. A random matrix model gives you a semicircular density of states, uh, and then you can just fill these states and, and create a compressible state at any density you want. Everyone with me? All right, so then next step you can do is look at the effect of interactions. If you look at the effect of interaction, and now here's one model where momentum doesn't, it's not even there. So the very simple argument I gave in the first lecture completely works. It's just exactly what goes through. Uh, and so what you find here is that near the Fermi level, uh, so near, from, uh, near epsilon, it depends on where you put mu, depending on how you think of it. Uh, so yeah, so imaginary part, well, or the Green's function, so with interactions, uh, the Green's function will be something like omega minus epsilon minus mu. This is, okay, I'm measuring E with respect to mu now, with respect to zero, not mu. Uh, and, and then there'll be a plus I times epsilon minus mu squared, something like that. So, so, that's, so that's, there's no Fermi surface, but as far as the Green's function is concerned, it looks like a Fermi liquid. There is some sense of quasi-particles sitting on, on, on these random states. Okay, <laughs> so that's the uh, world's simplest model of a Fermi liquid. <laughs> no momentum, just particles occupying random states. All right, so now I'm gonna take something much more interesting, uh, which we're still trying to understand, is the following model. I'm gonna take the model where I'm going to put the Tij equal to zero, okay? So I'm gonna take a following model which has only interactions, no hopping. <laughs> so here's the, here's the Hamiltonian. 
h is equal to minus sum. Well, so this is 1 over n to the, th oh gosh, I've forgotten, n to the 3 halves, I think, yeah. i, j, k, l equals 1 through n of v, i, j, k, l of c dagger i, c dagger j, c, k, c, l. And v, i, j, k, l are again Gaussian independent Gaussian random variables. So that's a model. So this model of this class was uh, looked at by uh, myself and Jin Wu, slightly different model uh, in 1993. <coughs> uh, and then Parkole and George, uh, George and Parkole studied these uh, around and also in some cases with me uh, around, uh, around 2000. And recently Kitev um, has talked about this, although hasn't written any papers yet, uh, 2001-15. And then there's something by me uh, recent preprint on the archive. Okay. <laughs> so it's taken a long time to start to understand this model. So here's a model where there's only interactions, no hopping, uh, and completely random. So what this model is that you've got some sites and then a, uh, an electron can only move if some other electron moves. It can't move on its own. It can move together. So any kind of rearrangement involves entanglement. So you can think of this as a model that is just entanglement. No, no kinetic energy, just entanglement. Uh, all right, so this is a, a model with Gaussian random numbers, which in fact is, is solvable in the large end limit. At least some aspects of it have been solved. Um, and uh, the way the solution proceeds is actually very similar to what I discussed over here. You do exactly the same trick. Uh, you just do perturbation theory in VIJKL, you average over VIJ, and you look at which graphs survive in the large end limit. So just like the rainbow graphs survived for the random matrix model, here, I guess there's no what the right, I don't know the right word for them, but there's a set of graphs which involve uh, sunset graphs or something. Uh, they're the only ones that survive in the large end limit. So, uh, so this ends up looking Um, so here, what you find is that, again, your g of omega is i omega plus mu minus sigma of omega. And then for sigma of omega, there's only, you know, you've got some v here. Now v involves four fermions. And the only graph that survives is this one, is this one. And then, of course, you can decorate every one of them as many times as you want in exactly the same way. This is the only thing that survives. Uh, so this becomes, this tells you that, so this is, it's easier in uh, time space. So this is sigma of tau. Uh, I forget, there's a minus v squared. Then g squared of tau, g of minus tau. So instead of getting sigma is equal to g, which I had somewhere, I guess sigma is roughly speaking g cubed. <laughs> uh, and every other graph is subdominant in the large and limit, as you can just see from the naive perturbation theory. I should say Wen Bo Fu is here, has been numerically studying this model, and many of his results are consistent with uh, all these statements. Um, all right, so now uh, you have to solve this model, you have to solve these equations. Here are the two equations that you have to solve. And they turn out to be, I'm almost out of time, quite, uh, you can partially solve them. Uh, and what you find is that for any mu, for any mu, so it's a compressible state. You can change the density as you want. Uh, what you find is that g of omega is some complex number uh, divided by square root of omega. So it's got a local Green's function that diverges. Uh, as 1 over square root of omega, and that's definitely not a Fermi liquid. It's got a non-Fermi liquid divergence. There's no quasi-particles, there's no poles. Uh, you know, in the other model, it was constant density of states. 
this is a diverging density of states. Uh, and so this looks like a, an example, a solvable model of a system that's a metal, but it's definitely as far as you can get from a Fermi liquid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, no, this is measured from zero. Yeah, so, huh? So here, omega is this omega right here, right? Okay. Yeah. So basically, sigma of zero cancels this mu, uh, and and then you get this one over square root of omega. All right. So there, there's some integral equations you have to solve, which we solved in '93 partly, uh, and and that gives you this sort of result. <laughs> No, it's a metal. It's a metal because it can have any density you want. It's gapless. It's got a gapless density of states on the Fermi level because the density of state diverges local density. If you did tunneling at any given point, right at zero energy, it'll be one over square root of omega divergence. <laughs> well, in some ways, yes. I mean, if you def if you somehow define this as coupled to some band, you have to define a notion of space. Uh, and that's what Parkole and George did. They take some band of electrons coupled to this density of states of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so you have to define it. You have to take some large d limit. You have to you take a model on a lattice with in, infinite. You know, take. Uh, you could redefine a different, yeah. different model and solve it the same way. Exactly. Yeah. Large that's right. So that's what Parkole and George did. And in fact, you do get linear resistivity. Uh, you do, <laughs> without any, you know, directly from the solution. The square root of omega is important for that result. And that comes out of, this square root is linked to this g cubed. If there's some other power of g, you get a different power here. <coughs> yeah. But also it's finite kinetic energy. Yeah. It, yeah, it goes away, it gets saturated at some constant, which depends on how much kinetic energy you put on. But that was also shown by Parkola and George. <laughs> So you've been talking about um, the strange metals having this one critical point. Yeah, this one. It's got a, it's a strange metal here that has linear resistivity, but no critical point. Is that right? Or is this a critical point? In some well, it's a critical point in the sense that the hopping has been sent to zero. If you turn on the hopping, then it immediately becomes a Fermi liquid. So it's, uh, it's certainly got one relevant direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the physical chemical potential of that is zero? No, there's, it, it turns out there's also Luttinger theorem. So the, the chemical potential determines the density of electrons, and that density of electrons determines theta. So there's like a modified Luttinger theorem. The theta depends on the density of electrons. The actual chemical potential doesn't matter. I mean, it, it's what determines your density, right? You can work with either. No, 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 this, okay, I, I may not have said it clearly. This is a physical singularity at, if you did tunneling, it's exactly at, at the chemical potential. It's at, 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 at zero energy for tunneling. You're bringing a particle in, yeah. So that only gets measured through the chemical Yes, this is a grand canonical, that's correct. I mean, how people say it, but yeah, it is, if you did a tunneling experiment, you brought an electron in uh, at zero energy, at the chemical potential, right, in the tunneling, you would see the singularity. It is a physical singularity. The, yeah. Sometimes yeah. groups are omega to the power of one half. Yes, uh, yes. You said that one can still get linear resistivity. Well, so you have to have uh, another band of electron scattering of this, uh, and then you get a linear resistivity in the other band. You think of these as kind of almost localized or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, well, let me just. Uh, I'm out of time. Let me just uh, flash another thing just for your entertainment. Uh, and then I'll stop. Just give me screen up. Oh, there. And uh, how do I? Oh, screen down. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> and then power on. Yeah. Yeah, great. So here's a summary on the left-hand side. Um, of this model of a strange metal. Uh, yeah. 
So, so that's the model, model right there. Okay, I call them J's, not V's. There's some red Gaussian random numbers. Uh, and uh, these are the references. Uh, and we uh, look at the ground state of this thing. Okay, so as I showed you, the density of states has a square root of omega singularity. And it also has a strange particle hole asymmetry. That depends on the chemical potential. And that kind of also makes sense. If you're right at the bottom of the band, then it's easier to add a particle and remove a particle. If you're right at the top of the band, it's easier to remove a particle and add a particle. And so E, this number E, uh, is determined by the chemical potential or the density. And in fact, for this model, you can figure out precisely the relation between the density and E. Uh, and it's really quite non-trivial. It comes from some kind of Luttinger theorem. Uh, the other uh, thing I haven't mentioned, this model turns out to have a macroscopic <laughs> ground state entropy. Uh, and this is part of the reason I, we kind of were almost ashamed of this model because it violates the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, and it has a ground state entropy density, meaning per site is a finite entropy density as temperature goes to zero. Uh, and, and it obeys this other bizarre looking relation, the derivative of the entropy with respect to the charge is this number E that appears in the particle hole asymmetry. So this it goes back to this work of Parkole et al. on multi-channel condo problems and conformal field theories. And eventually we realized it also applied here, where there's seemingly not no, no, no conformal invariance, but actually there is a hidden conformal invariance at low energy. And this is the relationship for the entropy. So there's lots of low energy states. Uh, and Kitev has made an analogy of these states to the, you know, when you have n quasi-particles in a non-abelian state, there's a 2 to the n over 2 degeneracy. Here it seems like the quasi-particles are always there because it's a gapless state. And this degeneracy in some way is protected, at least as long as you have these infinite range couplings. All right, so on the right-hand side, just for your pure entertainment, uh, I'm going to give you the results of classical calculations uh, on a theory of gravity. <laughs> so you take Einstein-Maxwell theory plus a cosmological constant, <coughs> which is this equation theory of our universe. <coughs> With one tiny change, you make the cosmological constant negative, have the opposite sign, and of order one, not of order ten to the minus one hundred and twenty. Okay. After that very small change, and you solve <laughs> these equations, uh, you get a solution of the universe that looks. It's kind of curved, it's called anti dissider space. It has a boundary uh, where you smeared some, you take boundary condition, you put some charge density on the boundary. So that creates some electric flux, that electric flux curved space, and the cosmological constant curved space. And eventually you get a black hole horizon. It's what people call an extremal black hole because, uh, well, because its metric looks like this, which is extremal uh, even uh, at zero temperature. I guess if you, I'm not going to teach you what an extremal black hole is in, in 30 seconds. <laughs> anyway, so now you do this a solution um, of Einstein Maxwell theory. Uh, then you compute, you take a fermion and have it move in this background, just a single fermion. And you compute a density of states, and you can choose the the mass of the fermion, cleverly enough, you'll get exactly the same form. Um, so that's kind of tuned. And then read off what this E is. And this E has this interpretation of an electric field that's created by this boundary charge in this curved space. OK, so then you open up uh, Hawking's paper and, other, and Wald and other people. OK, forget that. And Hawking told us that the entropy in black hole physics is just a geometric quantity, is the area of the horizon. So you ask the same question, you take the area of this horizon, and you ask, how does this change when I change the boundary charge density? So that's a purely geometric classical calculation. You do that calculation, uh, you get this relation. It, this derivative is related to uh, the, uh, this E, which is the parameter appearing here, just like over there. And now you see the relation, these two are consistent, provided uh, the entropy of the black hole is the area of the horizon divided by 4 times G Newton times uh, the area of the boundary, which is exactly the Hawking yeah, Bekenstein entropy. So this very trivial looking model has an entropy which, in fact, including the factor of 4, has the interpretation of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So, anyway, so there's a lot of excitement and we can actually use this, but you know, as you can see, this is a kind of a bizarre model. It's not something I'm going to 
tell my experimentalist friends about. Uh, but, <laughs> but it's teaching us a lot and of more realistic strange metals, and uh, that's why we're, we're working a lot on that. So thanks. <laughs> I guess it would be a lot easier to do an experiment on your model than on the... Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, I could imagine cold atom realization of this something. It's not, it may not, it's quite possible. You just take number of fermions in a cavity with some optical modes and... Well, yeah, you accidentally create a new universe, you okay? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Just arbitrarily add your C dagger and C dagger to be like over and over. C dagger and C, like... You mean you take six fermion interactions? Yeah, so for all of them, the, the smallest number is the one that's most important. And so if you take only six fermion interaction, you don't get the one half, you get some other exponent, I don't remember what it is. Uh, 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 but here you just stay in the mass, but this, everything works. So the, the only thing that's different is the two fermion interaction. That gives you a fermion liquid. All other cases give you non-fermion liquids and give you these kind of extremal horizons on this side. <laughs> Yeah. Make the range short range. Lose. Oh, that's a homework problem. I don't know. I mean, the hope is maybe even for reasonably short range, something like this could survive. Yeah, but you need some strong frustration to get. You know, this thing is obviously you know very delicate. It's got this microscopic entropy sitting there. Almost anything you do, it may want to become a superconductor or something else at low enough temperature. So it's kind of just designed to be a strange metal down to zero temperature, <laughs> which is not that realistic, but maybe in cold atoms you could build something like this. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Can you forget what epsilon is? So on this side, on the left-hand side, E is just how the interpretation of the particle hole asymmetry. This is the definition of E. Okay? You just measure the density of states. You have a, both the positive and negative frequencies. You have a squared omega singularity. Now, in a Fermi liquid, you know, there's just a constant. The two constants have the same value. It turns out here there's an asymmetry. Uh, and, and that asymmetry changes as you change the density. So when you have very high density, you can see that it's easier to remove a particle and add a particle. Your density will look like this. When you have low density, it'll look like this. So just these two singularities, E has either sign. Okay. So that defines E. Uh, and it's just a property of these models. When you look at these integral equations and solve them, so the ground state entry, this derivative is the, like this E. Uh, and amazingly, that equation was a Lagrange transform of this equation was written and is key to the work of Ashok Sen on black hole entropy and ADS2 horizons. He has an equation which is ds dE is equal to Q, uh, where there's a Lagrange transform essentially. And he uses that, and that comes from the walled entropy formula for black hole horizons. Uh, and, and then, of course, there they compute the actual macroscopic entropy using string theory. Here I'm computing it with this very simple model. But, uh, on, the, on the dual side, you're using kind of a spectator fermion? Well, so this is one of the debates right now. Uh, here, the, here, here the IR fermion and the, and the UV fermion are essentially the same. But the difference is that the UV fermion is gauge invariant and not conformal invariant, but the IR theory has both gauge and conformal invariant. So there's like an emergent gauge invariance and an emergent conformal invariance. Somewhat like the pneumatic critical point, but there's also an emergent gauge invariance. Uh, so people are on two sides of the fence on deciding. Tom may be on a different side at the moment. Here, it looks like there's an IR fermion has nothing to do with the charge behind the horizon, which is what you're measuring. You know, the charge here is equal to the charge behind the horizon. Uh, but they seem to be more closely connected that, than I had thought before. I think they're really the same. So, but this is a question of some debate. But on the, on the, on the gravity side, is, is there an interpretation of epsilon that doesn't have? So that's just like the electric field? It's the electric field, and that's all. The... Yeah, so, so you, can, you can forget about this calculation. This is needed to map E here. But this is purely classical calculation. You solve uh, Max, Einstein Maxwell, you get an electric field. You compute the walled entropy, and you find this relation. This is all completely classical. It's uh, zero mass? Sorry? Of course, zero. Uh, no, no, it's some value, some, some value. value. Yeah, yeah. So, but the E field breaks particle holes. Correct. The E field is the thing that breaks particle hole symmetry. Right. Um, Alexei Kataya told me an <laughs> aspen has an exact solution to any 
Uh, well, so first, yeah, I don't know what time you walked in. Let me just perfectly say yes, I certainly have cited his work. So his model uh, is where the C's are uh, Grassmann numbers. Uh, so Majorana's, not complex fermions. Uh, and that has the same solution. In fact, the solution is all the same as in this 93 paper. Uh, but here, I, it's important for me that I take complex rather than real fermions because only then do I have this charge density to vary. So he, he's like, he's kind of found the particle hole symmetric point. But it turns out even to understand the particle symmetric point is very useful to move away from it. And that's what I'm doing here. This model won't map on to the Maxwell. Yeah, so naively you would think it, it doesn't have a charged black hole dual. Uh, but I think eventually it will. That's my guess. It's kind of like a half of, so yeah. Uh, it's some overfold of it. I haven't fully understood how, yeah. <laughs> As with all Majorana, all things Majorana. <laughs> okay, we better thanks for lunch. Okay, thank you. <laughs>